Hi everyone, I'm Diego Francescangeli, a PhD student from the Anfield Lab at the PFL in Switzerland, and I'm going to show you my recent results. So, you may be not familiar with vortex dynamics in general, so let me first show you what we mean for secondary vortices and where we can first observe them. There are many configurations studied in fluid dynamics which involves the formation of vortices, and in many of them, the pattern can be ascribed as the formation of first a primary vortex followed by the formation of many other smaller vortices and we refer them as secondary vortices. We can observe them in a piston cylinder apparatus in the trailing jet after the vortex swing is formed. We can as well observe them in a translating objects or finally on a heaving airfoil. As you could see, secondary vortices appear in many flow configurations, and some of them are really widely explored in nature. For this reason, we decided to pick a configuration which is not as widely explored as the others, the rotating plate. The plate is placed into a tank filled with quiescent water and fastened to a rotation mechanism that allows the plate to rotate of 180 degrees around its mid code. The geometry we selected for the plate is a 16 cm span and an 8 cm code. The kinematic we decided to give and to assign to the plate is a trapezoidal motion in which the maximum achieved speed is varied in a range of 13 degrees per second to 400 degrees per second. The objective of this experimental campaign is to comprehend how the kinematics, more precisely the maximum achieved speed of the rotating plate, influence the timing at which secondary vortices are shed. Now that the, the objective is set, you may ask if secondary vortices always appear or there are conditions under which they don't, they don't appear. And to answer this question, I want to first show you uh, what happens to the flow topology if we increase, if we progressively increase the rotational speed. The lowest tested speed is 30 degrees per second, which corresponds to a Reynolds number defined with the maximum rotational speed as the varying parameter of 1680. The animation I'm going to show you next are making with a field of view rotating with the rotating plate. The shear layer is observed as a continuous layer of fluid that rolls up into the primary vortex core. If we now take the snapshots corresponding to an angular position of 105 degrees, we can see that the continuous shear layer rolls up into the primary vortex core with a spiral shape. If we now increase the Reynolds number to 3910, we can see a similar development to the previous case, but with a slight difference. If we take the same angular position of 105 degrees, this time the shear layer looks wavy and unstable, but it still rolls up with a spiral shape into the primary vortex core. Increasing again the Reynolds number will give you a totally different field of view, because now, instead of the shear layer, we have many secondary vortices. And if we refer again to the same angular position of 105 degrees, we can see that all of these secondary vortices are again placed along a spiral. As you probably noted, there are two things I stress more during the previous animations. The first one is the way the shear layer evolves, increasing the Reynolds number. The second one is how the three different regimes seems to follow pretty well a spiral shape. Varying the Reynolds number will vary the flow topology. We actually observed that for Reynolds number lower than 3000, the shear layer appears continuous. It starts to become stable in a range between 3000 and 4000, and after that, the occurrence of secondary vortices will place the shear layer. For this reason, as you could see from the animation before, we overlap the current spiral that has this equation in polar coordinate to the vorticity field, with the aim of computing the dimensionless vorticity 
along the spiral in time. Before showing the results, the next step is to understand how we track the dimensionless vorticity along the spiral for each instant of time. Alpha represents the angular position of the plate and it's used here as a measure of the dimensionless time, while L star is the dimensionless length position along the time varying cadence spiral. If we take the snapshot we observed before, the dimensionless vorticity is computed only along the spiral segment on which secondary vortices travel. The starting point is the top right edge of the plate, and the ending point is the point where secondary vortices merge with the primary vortex, and they cannot be distinguished anymore. Once we computed the spiral for each instant of time, we can retrieve the space-time evolution of the vorticity. As you can see, there are seven bands that correspond to seven shared secondary vortices. On the left side, we can see the trace of the primary vortex, and vortices from number 2 to 6 correspond to the ones highlighted in the previous snapshot taken at 105 degrees. Non-zero vorticity regions separate each band, and this reinforces the idea that secondary vortices are discreetly released from the plate tip. The center line of each vorticity band corresponds to a vorticity reach, and we extrapolated all of them and fit in the end with a second order polynomial curve, as shown here. If we focus on the region highlighted by the dashed rectangle, you can note black crosses correspond to the point at which the polynomial fit intersect the x-axis. This is assumed to be as the separation point of each secondary vortex. The timing in degrees and seconds are then computed as the average time and angle between successive separation time. For this Reynolds number of 16,760, secondary vortices are shared approximately every 13 degrees or every 0.042 seconds. Only the last one does not respect this pattern, and this is probably due to the fact that this is forming during the plate deceleration, which might delay uh, the separation time of the last secondary vortex. I've now explained how I computed the timing of secondary vortices in degrees and seconds only for one Reynolds number. But the same exact methodology is used for all the tested cases we have, even at lower Reynolds number. So for the results section, let's first have a look at the space-time vorticity, evolution along the spiral for lower Reynolds number. Contrary to the previous case, at the lowest Reynolds number, the space-time vorticity plot appears as a region of constant vorticity, which proves a stable shear layer for the whole tested range with no sign of secondary vortices. With a Reynolds number increased to 3,110, vorticity bands appear in the plot, but the bands this time are not separated by non-zero vorticity region as it was before. This made us think of a topology where the vortices appear as a result of an unstable and wavy shear layer. Now, as the final result, we want to show how the Reynolds number influences the timing at which secondary vortices are shed. So, the timing is computed for all the cases where bands are observed in the space-time plot of vorticity along the cadence spiral. If we compute the timing, as you can see here, in seconds, we observe a decrease with the Reynolds number. Well, this is not really surprising, because the rotation speed is higher at higher Reynolds number, which has the logical consequence of giving a smaller timing. But if we now consider the timing in degrees, we observe a release of secondary vortices approximately every 20 degrees. This is very interesting, because it shows that the Reynolds number is responsible for the occurrence of secondary vortices, as we see up to now, but it doesn't affect uh, at all the spacing at which vortices are shed. And something more, it proves that the plate angular position is a valid scaling parameter to describe the frequency at which secondary vortices separate. To summarize and conclude in the end, we observe the existence of three different flow topologies or regimes that are strongly dependent on the Reynolds number. The common feature between them is the spiral shape that allows us to fit all the cases with current separation. We also define the timing in degrees and seconds, and compute it for every tested cases with a Reynolds higher than 3000. 
The timing in second is obviously decreasing with the Reynolds number, while on the other side, the angular timing remains constant for every tested Reynolds number. And this is the end of my presentation, and I really hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much for watching, and if you have any questions or thoughts to share, I'm really pleased to take them.